Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Hunter. Stella, it is wonderful having you here. Thank you so much for uh, making some time for this really exciting conversation today. Oh, thank you so much. Um, wonderful to meet you, Noel, and, and Hunter as well. Thanks for the warm welcome. Of course. So, you know, taking a look at what the topic is today, it's all about climbing the ladder. Uh, and you have built such a successful career over the last three decades. Um, can we hear a little bit about your journey from being a business analyst to where you are now as a global senior director of security, governance, risk, compliance, and privacy over at Expedia? And also just to add on to that, did you know that that was where you're going to land? <laughs> Actually, no, but thank you for the for the for for the compliment. You know, um, the last the last thirty years, and I I actually struggled when I saw the word thirty. I'm like, oh my gosh, thirty years! I have been blessed beyond measure. And mm. so, um, you know, for me, it, it started with my parents. Uh, my parents had always instilled in me the belief that you know, hard work yields results, and I should always strive for a better tomorrow. Uh, my husband, from day one that we met became the wind beneath my wings, propelling my dreams and continuously encouraging me to believe in myself. My journey started off in, um, in um, West Africa where I was born. I was born in Ghana and I grew up in Australia and um, in, in Canberra. Um, I did my undergrad in Australia and I landed my first job at Optus Communications where I was a business analyst. And through that journey, it, it occurred to me that, you know, the more roles I held, um, the better my experience, the better my ability to empathize with those that I worked with, having, you know, walked in their shoes, and the better my ability to really drive change and to create win-win solutions along the way. So 2022 afforded for me um, the good fortune to work in an amazing company like Expedia. Um, through serendipity, the opportunity to combine my joy for travel to build better traveler outcomes came my way. Meeting the people and leaders at Expedia and learning about its culture, its values and mission um, were an enormous draw for me. And at the end of the day, it was about the warmth of the people and the passion mm -hmm. that we shared that, that really drew me. I am proud to be an Expedian, um, working to power global travel for everyone, everywhere, and securely driving better traveler outcomes um, through digital trust and technology. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about your path. Uh, one thing that I meant to say when we got started, if anyone has any questions for Stella, she obviously has a wealth of experience here. Please sure to put that into the chat so I can make sure to ask those questions to her. Um, but I have plenty of questions of my own. Um, Stella, what would you say are some of the challenges or setbacks that you face as when climbing the corporate ladder? And would you say that these sorts of setbacks were ever leading to imposter syndrome? And how do you overcome that? Oh, that's an excellent question. And, and went to why I started off with my background of, you know, being born in one country, growing up in another and living in the US. So um, along my career, I was told I was long winded. I needed to be more eloquent, needed more executive presence, and the list goes on and on. In my mind, feedback is a gift. However, some gifts are not meant to be kept. They're only meant to be held for a time. And for me, this resulted in imposter syndrome because I felt that I was never good enough. It also occurred to me, though, that outside of corporate America, I actually was eloquent. I could touch people through speech. I could inspire others. I could make a lasting impact. And that when I coupled that with my strengths of st um, strategic and execution proficiency and my ability to lead, grow, and develop top talent, as well as collaborate and innovate to create win-win solutions, I actually did have potential. Something my, my number one fan, my husband, who's also a phenomenal leader, would keep reminding me of, and he would say, your time will come, just keep swimming. A couple of things happened. I met an extraordinary leader. Um, her name is um, Priscilla Cranting. She is currently the chief privacy officer at Indeed.com and who's a woman leader who opened my eyes to the art of the possible. At the time, I was also mentoring with a leader I truly admired. His name is um, Gustavo Lara. He's a CIO at Abbott Labs. Both helped me face some home truths. Both leaders co coached me through um, fierce conversation and told me to focus more on my strengths and work to improve those areas as rather the cherry on top versus the other way around. 
and create openings for myself instead of waiting for opportunities to fall into my lap. I felt that I could actually exhale. I could be more in control of my destiny and believe that I truly deserved a seat at the table. My number one fan, my husband, would later say to me, hey, I told you all of this already, but you just had to hear it through a different voice to believe it. This reminded me of a saying from um, Winston Churchill, um, where he says, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts and keep striving because tomorrow takes care of itself. And for me, I realized I just had to be ready for tomorrow. Um, during this period, I also have had good fortune of working with trailblazing leaders, including CISOs at my last two companies, Joe Mendel at Kellogg, um, Tim Youngblood, and Sean Marion at McDonald's. And my current CISO, Kurt John, and our SVP, um, Ty Strickland, who are outright shining examples of Black excellence. I cannot say enough about their support, their mentorship, and their sponsorship in helping me to get to this place today. And that's, for me, how I became um, and overcame my imposter syndrome, because others reached back to pull me higher, and my commitment is to continue to pay this forward. Mm, absolutely. You know, you shared so much about mentorship, and uh, Hunter shared that was something that I'm, I'm really passionate about. One of the challenges that a lot of Black professionals can run into is being able to get connected to mentors. What advice would you give to somebody who's looking to find that right mentor for them? Actually, um, it's something I learned when I was part of ITSMF, which is uh, which we fondly call it's my family. And it's really about creating a board of directors. It's looking for leaders and people in all walks of life and depending on where you are in your situation, reaching out and asking those individuals to mentor you and be specific about what you need. It's also about understanding the difference between a mentor and a sponsor. A mentor mm -hmm. is somebody who can coach and guide you. A sponsor is somebody who can open the doors for you. And they're, they're in the room when opportunities are, are, are around to say, I believe this individual can achieve and can do this and really speak on your behalf. So making sure you have a combination of mentors and sponsorship and you have an evolving board of directors is a way of life, in my opinion. Mm, excellent. Thank you so much, Stella. You know, so we talked a little bit about the challenges and setbacks, but let's talk about some of these wins that you've experienced along the way. Um, so how do you achieve those goals and what kind of support did you receive in order to achieve those goals? Ah, that's a great question. So one of my wins I received along the way was um, gaining my first security certification. Um, I have an undergrad in computer science and statistics with a minor in mathematics, and I have a master's degree and a, a graduate certificate in telecommunications management. Um, but in 2020, 2015, I had an opportunity when I was at McDonald's to create, um, actually at Kellogg, I should say, to create um, a data security um, governance program office. I had spent most of my career leading PMOs and successfully driving large-scale enterprise and um, globally strategic initiatives. And I put my hand up for a change of pace after a very insightful session with one of my mentors called Adrian Butler, who is currently the CIO at Casey's General Store Inc. Knowing that I had a lot to learn, I embarked on gaining that experience and learning from folks within the industry who were very gracious with their time with me, including Adrian and Michael Palmer, who's the CISO at Hearst, and at the time was the CISO at the NFL. By um, 2020, 2017, I had a couple of years under my belt, and I wanted to gain a certification to be taken seriously by my peers, but I couldn't seem to sustain enough momentum to study. One day, my husband casually inquired what my new excuse was, and I tried patiently to explain to him. He looked at me over our kitchen island and said, Stella, I know how bad you want this, and I'm going to remove all your excuses, so you're going to study and pass the exam. Mm -hmm. Over 12 months, in addition to his busy work, he took care of running the house, cooking and feeding our family of five, and did everything, so I had no excuses. He gave me the room I needed to stay at work each day to study a couple of hours, and my teammates cheered me on and made sure I transitioned from work to study at the end of the day. 
within a year, I had passed not one, but two certifications. I had gained my, uh, my CISM, which is a Certified Information Security Manager, and my CRIS, which is the equivalent for somebody in the risk management space. And after this, he said to me, okay, now you're done. All the cooking is yours and 50% of the housework. <laughs> my husband is an exceptional person and a rock for all ages. He is truly the wind beneath my wings and propels me to fly higher. Wonderful. It sounds like he's an amazing cheerleader for you. And, and really having that support at home really does seem to make all the difference. Um, you know, uh, in a past life, I actually spent some time working in privacy with a company called Future Privacy Forum. And through that work, I was able to see some of the trends that were happening in the privacy world. And I was seeing a lot of women uh, coming into leadership positions in privacy, which was really great to see, but not so many black people. Um, are you seeing that there's a shift happening in the privacy world where there's becoming more room at the table for marginalized people? Absolutely. And it's upon us to create those opportunities and safe spaces so that we can bring that diversity of leadership in the conversation around, around privacy. Um, for me, one of the things that I love about it, uh, Expedia is it, it, it's, its willingness um, to open its eyes to what to the art of possible. Um, our workforce represents um, a makeup of the communities that we're located in. And privacy is something that we're serious about because it really drives our organize, it, it drives, you know, the industry that, that we're in. So in terms of digital trust, in terms of, you know, um, creating outcomes that our travelers would love, we need to represent the voice of a diverse group of individuals when it comes to privacy. Wonderful. I'm I'm sorry. Looks like my mic got cut off. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Perfect. All right, great. So my next question here, as someone who's worked at various large corporations, what do you believe Expedia Group is doing differently to support their employees' growth, especially those who are in marginalized communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at EG, our belief is that travel is a force for good. Um, EG holds um, over 400 million traveler user accounts. And in any given month, we have over 112 unique visitors across 60 plus countries with operational um, representation. Inclusion and diversity are a core part of who we are um, as we work to deliver solutions that forge travel and partner trust. And in order to do so, we include conscientiously and celebrate our colleagues' unique differences, identities, and lived experiences. And as I said earlier on, our workforce is more representative of the makeup of the communities that we're located. And we embrace the fact that with a team of diverse employees, you have access to more creativity and wider skill sets. And as a result, more diverse ideas for solving business problems, which help our company grow. EG's goal is for 25% of all external hires to be from underrepresented communities, also known as URI. And that's within the US alone. And once that talent is here, we're creating a sense of belonging for all employees. In 2022, in actually in the US, we actually achieved 27% of UR hires. Um, another goal that is super important for me is that by 2025, we wanna see 50% of all levels represented by women. And for this, we're pretty much on target, myself being one of those. Expedia does it. Yes, Expedia does exceptionally well when it comes to creating safe places for people to just be the authentic self. And Expedia has allowed me to be me, um, to be my quirky, Guinean, Australian, American self. And at Expedia, I feel like I have found my work home. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's really the goal. We should all feel like we found our work home. Um, and, you know, to that point, for somebody who's looking to climb the ladder like you did, but not really sure, like when when do we know it's the right time to start to move to that next level? Because, you know, sometimes we get a little comfortable. When do we know it's time to stretch and start to look for that next opportunity? Yeah, I, I don't know whether it's a good way to really answer that question. But for me, it's always been about my passion. It has been about my passion to, to you know, to, to, um, to be a positive influence in other people's lives. It's my passion to create and pave the way for others 
um, to follow and, you know, fulfill their life's mission. And so for me, that's why I wanted to become a leader. I wanted to become a leader because of the power it gave me to make a difference in other people's lives. And for me, it just felt, it felt natural from day one. For others, it, it may be about how they want to, uh, you know, reach for the stars. It may be how they want to, you know, create something that is new, exciting, that's never been done before. It starts with a passion. And I think once you have that passion, then you need to lay the groundwork for how you 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 really move forward. Um, there's a there's a couple of things that you know I would say in, in in terms of advice for that. And one is, as I said, your personal board of directors. If you surround yourself with those people that believe in you, that can guide you and can act as a sounding board, these are people who can tell you the truth and speak to the truth of whether you are truly ready to be a leader and the steps you need to take and can can help you build a network of other individuals who you can emulate, learn from, and and bounce ideas off. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm really hearing that it's important to really tap into that passion. And when it doesn't seem like that's right, maybe it is time to start to tap into our board of directors, see what we think will be that next step and, and really make sure that we're aligned with our mission. Thank you for that, Stella. Um, So another question here for you, what advice or words of encouragement would you give to fellow professionals from marginalized groups with ambitions of one day becoming a leader like yourself? Yeah, so it often starts with small steps, not giant leaps, and and that brings about the most lasting change. Um, I I gave you one of my five actions that I was going to speak to today in terms of, you know, that question got asked, what would I say? (laughs) But I have a couple more for you. So number two would be, yes, number two would be be an avid and nimble learner for life. Have the humility and a hunger to learn. Use both success and failures as learning experiences and learn from everyone, everywhere. Number three for me would be be conscious and focused. Nothing happens if you're not intentional about it. Number four would be leverage um, art in your communications. Art stands for audience, response, and tone. Know your audience what response you're looking for, and what tone you need to set to drive response that you're seeking. And number five is the big one for me because I have this as a plug in my office. It's about the following. Remember, at 211 degrees, water is hot. At 212 degrees, it boils. And with boiling water comes steam, and steam can power a locomotive. The one extra degree makes all the difference. So sometimes, It's just about putting in that extra effort to really get to the place where you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That would be my advice. That's excellent advice. Thank you so much. Um, As allies are working here to tackle the inequalities that restrict the progression and the achieve, oh, sorry, how can allies help to tackle the inequalities and uh, that restrict the progression and achievement of underrepresented talent, do you feel? Yeah, I have a very super simple answer for this. Um, If you remember Amanda Gorman's poem, um, her poem, The Hill Hill We Climb, there's a a, a phrase in there that says, there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Mm. Allies can help forge a union with purpose of unity, collaboration, and togetherness. And I think you can fill me in a well. They can create safe spaces for everyone. Allies understand the past we step into and how to repair it to drive out the inequalities that restrict progression and achievement of underrepresented talent. Allies can help by being brave to see the light and brave enough to be the light for all of us. I love that. And thank you for bringing it back to such an amazing poem. I'm going to reread that after this, just because I think that 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 tapped in with a lot of us who heard that for the first time. So thank you. You know, one of the things that you had mentioned before was how important it is to always be learning wherever you go. Um, So I'm curious, what would you say is one of the biggest lessons that you've learned from maybe one of the leaders that you had been watching throughout your career? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, Something, something that um, Tim Youngblood told me was that, Stella, you don't have to be perfect. Mm. You, you, you strive to be perfect all the time. You do not need to be perfect. Mm-hmm. You just need to deliver and you need to give yourself breathing room. 
And sometimes when we're striving to get to the next level, we feel like we have to be perfect in everything we do. That's exhausting. It is okay. so exhausting, right? We, we, we stop living life because we are striving and striving so hard. I'm a striver and I will continue to strive. But I think by being perfect, what I was not doing is I wasn't learning equally from my successes and my failures. I was focusing more on my failures and not really you know, realizing and celebrating my successes. And that's why I speak to the fact that you have to take them both in equal measures so that you can get that sense of balance and sense of inner, speed, inner peace and be able to drive for, for a better tomorrow for yourself. Hmm. You know, what you're saying, it reminds me of what a lot of Black people are told, even as a very young age, that you have to work twice as hard to get half as far. Um, and we're starting to see a little bit of a shift in that and understanding a little bit more when it comes to balance. Um, is there any advice that you would give to somebody who's looking to shift that mindset that, you know, like you were saying, with, with not being perfect all the time and maybe, you know, I can work hard, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to work myself to death. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who's struggling with that? Yeah, I think for me, it was, it was finding voice, finding my voice to be able to speak to that, finding my voice to be able to get perspective perspective and that perspective really helped me to to you know see be be around the corner and um, really look back to other things I've done um I am a high achiever <laughs> so that's always gonna be a problem we love that about you <laughs> that's always gonna be a problem but I I feel like the sounding board in speaking to people who you trust in having people at the table with you when you're in meetings and others who afterwards can give that feedback to really say, hey, here's where, here's where you excel. Here's where you just knocked the ball out of the park. Here's where if you did, the, you did the following things, you could have been even better. And here are the things you need to continue to do. When people speak in that tone with you and they speak in that way, it gives you the chance of connecting your thought with, with the possibilities that you seek for yourself versus, mm -hmm. you know, Oops, today wasn't such a good day, so I screwed up and I'm done. There's no other chance. No, actually, today was 95% good. It was just 5% that if you tweak it a little bit, mm -hmm. it would have been 100%. So you, you learn from the success, and then you take the failure, and you combine it, and tomorrow you're going to come back and you're going to be 120%. You're just going to wow everybody. I love that. That's a really great way to shift that mindset. I appreciate that thought. That's something I'm definitely taking away with me. Um, finally, when you take a look at the future with Expedia, what excites you about what's coming and, and what you're seeing with working for a great company like Expedia? Oh my gosh. One of the things I'm truly excited about is I am working with, um, with our, our legal team to establish a new privacy operations center. Um, mm. This is a, a game changer for um, Expedia as a whole, because um, up until now, we really haven't had a one clear vision and mission when it comes to um, um, privacy. And so what we did was um, we brought in um, one of the big fives. Um, we brought in Deloitte um, to assess our, um, our security posture and our privacy posture. And... Um, they looked to us and said, look, here are the things you're doing great. Here are the things where, you know, you have opportunities for, for, making, for making it, you know, much better. So for us, it's very transformative. Um, from a strategic standpoint, we're going to have a North Star with clear objectives and key results that will help to drive the program outcome. Um, our current model, we feel, is not optimally structured to maintain and expand, you know, our privacy operations. So, um, we're super excited about, you know, creating this operation center and getting to the, the, the heart and the business of, of, you know, what we call privacy by design. Um, there are some key outcomes, at least six that we're, we're, we're looking for. It, and that's what makes me like, yay, this is awesome. Um, looking to embed privacy by design into EG's DNA um, to drive privacy at scale and enable platform excellence. We're looking to increase our responsiveness um, to drive travel and love to grow traveler love, I, I mean to say, we're looking to um, reduce our internal friction to accelerate world-class privacy first products. Um, we're looking to create greater scrutiny. Um, sorry, we're, we're looking to um, um, 
to create greater transparency because you know in the world of cybersecurity and and you know all the regulations around i mean it, we have to be clear in terms of you know what we do with um with our customer data and make sure that our partners um really you know believe and trust that we have their hearts in mind um, we're looking to untap privacy as a competitive advantage um, to empower expedia's growth through innovation and then um the final thing is to really future proof and unlock value beyond just being compliant with regulation um, to overall power the industry so that people fall in love and stay in love with the power of travel and that travel mm -hmm. remains a force for good. I love that. Um, I know we just have two minutes left here. Do you have any last minute advice that you can give to our group? And also how can people stay in contact with you? Um, my, 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 one, my one final advice is you are all you need to be. You are mm. awesome. You are brought here for a purpose. Find your purpose, find your passion and go for it. For those that want to stay in contact, I'm on LinkedIn. Look for Stella Dansko um, at Expedia Group. I'd love to connect and I'd love to stay in touch. And um, I'd love to power you to fly. So this is so amazing. You are incredible. And I've learned so much from you today. I hope our audience has as well. Thank you so much for coming today and um, giving us your very valuable time. We appreciate you. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to pay for it. Take care, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.